Welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neuronal Dynamics of Cognition. So in the previous section, we have observed simulations and made some observations about the population activity. Now we want to get mathematical. Can we mathematically predict the population activity given the connection probability P, the weights, the properties of individual neurons, and we can assume a large population? Can we mathematically define stationary asynchronous activity? Now, to address these questions, we will dive into the mathematics, and I will develop with you a mean field argument. I will calculate in this section the input to a neuron, and we'll see that the population activity plays a major role. So we start from our observations in the simulations. You observed in these particular simulations that the activity is nearly constant. We can define a value of the activity A0. And this value of the activity is independent of the number n of neurons. Moreover, we had an interesting observation, and that's that the typical input is more or less the same for each neuron, whether it's neuron number 10 or neuron number 3025. Now, yeah, I said the activity is constant, but at the same time, we observe that we have these large fluctuations around. So we have to define what we really mean by stationary asynchronous activity. And let's start to do this. Let's just recall the basic idea. I have a simulation, I have many, many different neurons. I can follow one neuron, for example, this neuron here, and then I see a couple of spikes. I could look into the details of the simulation, and then I would see the membrane potential that fluctuates here below a threshold. Here it reaches the threshold. I get the first spike, the second spike, the third spike. But here we are only interested in the spikes. Moreover, we are not interested in the spikes of one neuron, but we are in the interested in the spikes of many neurons. So here we average over many, many neurons. In total, it's a simulation with 50,000 neurons. 40,000 excitatory ones and 10,000 inhibitory ones, and they are randomly connected. And at this point here, the input has changed from low rate input to high fine rate input. So here more spikes arrive from, the, from other populations, and therefore the activity increases. But for the moment, we are interested in these segments where the activity is nearly constant, apart from fluctuations. So, what was our definition of the activity? I said, you know, I take a small time window, delta t, and I count the number of spikes. So I have my population activity, a bar of t, which is the number of spikes between t and t plus delta t. And then I divide by the number of neurons, and I divide by delta t. Now, the momentary activity is this limit where I take delta t to zero. So I take limit delta t to zero of a bar of t. Limit delta t to zero of n bar of t. And this basically means I have a super short time window. And in this short, super short time window, I just count the spikes across the neurons and I still divide by n. In this limit, I get the sum over all neurons i. i runs from 1 to n. This is my index i, the neurons. And I sum over all spikes, f. This is the spike index. Because it doesn't matter whether the spike I hit here in this short time window is the spike number 3 or the spike number 27 of a given neuron. So f is the running spike index, first spike, second spike, third spike. And it doesn't matter which spike which number, which label of spike I find. So this is a sum over all spikes of all neurons. Now in this limit, where delta t is to zero, in fact, in each time segment, it's just either there's a spike or there's no spike. So actually, it's important that I have this kind of little averaging window, because otherwise, the result is, in most times, in most 
time points, there are actually zero spikes. A spike is just a point in time, it's just a very short event. If the delta t is too short, I wouldn't encounter any spike at all in most cases. So more generally, I can, I have to work with a filtered version of this. So I can take my a of t and I filter it with some filter, say filter gamma. I take this integral over this filter and then this would be my e bar of t. Now this filter gamma could be a little square pulse filter of duration delta t. Then I'm back to my pre previous definition. Or it could be a short exponential pulse with some duration delta t. Or it could be some smooth symmetric pulse, for example a Gaussian pulse with some width delta t. It doesn't really matter what type of filter I use. It doesn't matter what exact duration delta t I use. It could be in the range of one, two, five milliseconds. Any good filtering process will do the trick. And this is, this is the function which I can plot. I cannot plot delta functions, but I can plot this kind of filtered function. And here is, I record just from five neurons. I've simulated, say, 5,000 neurons, but I pick five different neurons, say, these neurons here, 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 and there, and I take this sum of all the spikes of all the neurons, I filter it with an exponential filter, and I get this population activity. But I could do the same with 10 neurons, and I get this population activity. I can do it with 100 neurons, I get this. I can do it with 1,000 neurons, and I get something very similar, except that the fluctuations will become smaller and smaller. So the size of the fluctuations for a fixed filter will depend on the number of neurons from which I record. Let's call this the, the test size. I simulate a total of 5,000 neurons, but within this group of neurons, I record from just 5 or just 10 or from a test size of 100 or a test size from 1,000. So this is our first notion, the activity filtered with a short filter. Now our second notion is the expectation. I could run this simulation once, this is the result. I could repeat it, I get a second result, which will look similar. I can repeat it 10 times, I can repeat it 100 times, I can repeat a total of m repetitions. Now I can average the results of many repetitions and I can say the expectation that of a of t is my a of t that I would have measured in a single trial and as sum over all these repetitions and I divide by the total number of repetitions and m should be super large. So I take the limit m to infinity. So this is the expectation of the population activity over many, many repetitions. Now if I make more and more repetitions, then these fluctuations will average out and I get something which is smoother and smoother. Note that for any finite m, it's still important that I use some filter. It can be a very short filter, maybe just 0.1 millisecond duration. But I still need a filtering process, otherwise I just have singular events sticking out. Now, formally, if I take the limit m to infinity, I could say I have asynchronous activity, a stationary state of asynchronous activity, if this expectation is constant. Now, since I never have the possibility to run infinitely many repetitions, even 100,000 repetitions costs a lot in terms of simulation time, I can look at this also slightly differently. I use this filtered population activity, say filter with a time constant of one millisecond, and I look at the difference to my reference value A0. I, will, I want to check whether such an A0 exists. Now, if this difference is squared, which means it doesn't matter whether I have a positive peak or a negative, if these 
differences are small, then I would say, well, I'm in a state of asynchronous activity. Now, how can I check for this? Well, it's interesting to look at, at these kind of plots. We started with a test size of 5, and this is the A bar for the test size of 5. And then I can compare A bar test size 10, A bar test size 100, A bar with test size 1000. And uh, I look at these differences and I consider that the test size gets bigger and bigger. Then this difference, this measure of the fluctuations should go down in expectation. So what I sketch here is the idea of convergence in a weak sense. It's weak convergence in the Hilbert space. You can think of the filter function gamma as a test function. Then you plug it in, you construct a sequence of bigger and bigger uh, test sizes. And the result doesn't depend on the exact choice of a test function. So if this limit for n test size increasing goes to zero, then we can say we have a state of asynchronous activity, a zero constant activity in expectation. So in practice, you filter, you look at different test sizes, and if the fluctuations go down with the test size, then you're good, you're in a state of asynchronous activity. Now, this is not always the case. Let's come back to the example I discussed before, a population of neurons driven by a time-dependent stimulus. Here I have more spikes in this region than in that region. So if I look at the population activity, it will have these fluctuations. And now these are systematic fluctuations. Whether I look at the test size of only 5 neurons or 10,000 neurons, if I compare with a constant reference value A0, there are systematic fluctuations which do not go away. And that is why we are not in a state of asynchronous stationary firing. So these systematic oscillations are not asynchronous stationary in the sense I introduced before.